Good afternoon. Welcome to the plenary session of the faculty meeting at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and faculty and staff and students and others, I'd like to welcome you to this time, and I would like to welcome at this time Chancellor Mark Money to give the plenary address. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. Delighted to see you all and hope you had a wonderful, relaxing spring or uh, winter break with family, friends, thinking ahead here. Um, <laughs> I'm going to look ahead today, but not quite that fast, that quickly. Um, but uh, I, I hope your semester also is off to a, a great start. And I look forward to talking to you today about UWM 2020, a commitment to a strong future. I'll start today by giving you an overview of the four areas that we'll cover. Primarily, we'll talk about our budget progress, process and outlook. We'll move on and talk about strategic opportunities, that is a look ahead in terms of, of leadership and, and sharply defining our future. And then uh, looking ahead at what I consider to be five essential elements. We'll have time for Q&A at the end. Before I begin, I'd like to share with you and emphasize why we're here, why it's so critical that we do what we do every day. And that's illustrated by the pictures at the bottom of the screen here. And I'm just going to take a moment to set my timer to try to manage my time. Feedback suggests that I need to really make sure I take, uh, take, take good care of this. And what you see on the lower left-hand side is Amanda Porter, who's a student intern at the um, WTMJ4. In the middle, Juan Orgila, who is working over at the uh, Lakeshore Veterinary Specialists. And on the far right-hand well, right side, Erinci Flores, who is uh, working as a student intern at AG Architects in Wauwatosa. These students really epitomize what we do. We create the talent pipeline, we create doors and pathways for student success based on our research prowess, the things that we do to engage in the community. It's all fundamentally woven together, and so that'll be a theme that I'll talk about over and over again today. So the first building block, a way to think about this, and what we've all been engaged in for the past couple of years, is managing through the budget challenges that have been facing higher education, specifically those at UWM, have put us in a situation where we've had to make some, some uh, uh, decisions and, and undertake some directions that, that have been different than what we've had to do before, and those will continue. The specific goal is to, to realize a balanced budget by 20. 2020-2021 biennial budget. We have been having extensive meetings over the last several years, and those have been focused on reducing the budget beyond the 40 million that we've already reduced our budget to continue this year to bring another $15 million out of our budget by the end of the year. We simply don't have a choice, but we have to really manage the budget expenses with the revenues that are available. Our Provost Brits, and Vice Chancellor Van Harpen have been having for the last two weeks meetings with schools and colleges. Those will continue next week. And these have been some of the most detailed, engaged conversations with the leadership, faculty, and staff in the various schools and colleges. Some key takeaways have emerged from those meetings. One is that enrollments will continue, most likely, to decline through 2020-2021 budget period. We're facing significant demographics, but we also while we'll be different, can shape a strong future. And that's what really the goals have been about. How do we best position our research, teaching, engagement activities to make sure that we're prosperous in the future? We are on track through this year, and some units are ahead of others, but we'll continue to focus on making sure that we get our budget in a strong, balanced situation. As you know, strategic position control is the main mechanism through which we have been working on our budget, and we haven't been able to be very strategic in the first year, but we're at the point today, and we'll be increasingly at the point where we can be more strategic, but we have to achieve um, the, the, the goals and objectives that are in front of us. We will continue to have discussions across the campus through my monthly budget updates, semester meetings, as well as other mechanisms as we learn more about the budget, and in particular some of the things with the state budget that will be happening. As you know, we've been having meetings around our integrated shared services and other budgeting initiatives, and we continue to provide that information. 
on the website, we put everything up that we know and we've been as transparent and as open as possible as we've been making the decisions. That's some of the things in terms of some of the progress and, pro, um, progress and, and the process underway, but there's also some aspects where we, we do look ahead toward our future budget. And as we look at the next biennial budget, 1719, we know a few things, but I must stress that we don't know everything at this point. One thing we do know is that in December, the Board of Regents approved several different actions. They suggested and approved a $42.5 million biennial budget operating request. That budget is premised on the Forward 2020 Strategic Plan. Uh, it's online, it's available. There's a number of hard copies that are circulating around in various offices. This essentially is a platform for that $42.5 million request. And there's a number of elements in that that we're making sure that we line up across our campus and all the campuses across the system. I'm gonna come back to the point of that document in a moment. There's also the assumption of the restoration of $50 million that was elapsed from the prior biennial budget. So together, that request is seen by some, and you'll hear discussion of this, of a $92.5 million request. But it's really a $50 million lapse, as well as the $42.5 million operating budget. This does not include the significant request that we have for the capital budget, which will be announced later, probably in March of this year. There was a limited tuition increase that actually had two different facets. One facet of that was that which was covered in terms of some of the out-of-state undergraduate uh, enrollment, undergraduate tuition increases, but that excluded the Milwaukee, or I'm sorry, the Midwest, Midwestern State Exchange Program. So that really won't affect us that much because most of our students that are from, from uh, outside of Wisconsin are primarily from the MSEP states. There's also a tuition uh, proposal that was uh, endorsed and approved by the regents, which was to continue the budget freeze, I'm sorry, continue the tuition freeze for a fifth year, and then after the fifth year, which would be the first year of the next biennial budget, to have that next year with a modest or 2% tuition increase. So that's the thinking, and that's, that's what, what was uh, approved at, at that point, as well as an, a, a 2% compensation increase for each of the next two biennial budget years that was also endorsed and supported by the Board of Regents. This could change, of course, because the governor will announce his budget on February 8th, and we don't know what that will contain, but so far uh, there seems to be, from legislative discussion, support. People think the requests are reasonable. As you've probably seen in the press, there was uh, embedded the suggestion that there may be a tuition cut. There is also, from the governor's aides, what has been presented in the same, same uh, media information, that there would be a uh, way to keep the budget whole, that there would be base or GPR budget that would help keep that whole if there is, in fact, a tuition cut. From discussion with legislators, there's, there's different views and perspectives on that, so this is one of those things that we simply will learn more about, both when the governor's budget is announced as well as uh, later as we see how it works its way through the legislature. So those are some of the things that we look at uh, for the future right now. Before I move off the budget, I have to tell you about one of the most important things that we've been doing beyond managing the budget. We're doing pretty much everything we can to advocate strongly and effectively for UWM as well as being part of the UW system to support that request. And let me give you one example of something that was very tangible that's been happening uh, quite a bit. <clears throat> On January 11th this year, we had a meeting where you can see with uh, Senator Darling on the left and Representative Nigren on the right. If you don't know, those are um, the co-chairs of the Joint Finance Committee. And the Joint Finance Committee has about, I could be wrong, 16 or 18 members of the legislature, and they are the ones that really represent both the Senate and Assembly with regard to managing the budget that the governor gives through the state process throughout the spring. The members of Joint Finance are the ones that we have been especially working on to meet with. I met with Senator Darling in early December with our former regent, System president, our former regent president, Mike Falbo, and we were talking about a recent event that, that occurred at Rockwell. I'll tell you more about that as I end my plenary today. And she suggested that we have a showcase event 
when we had Representative Nygren and herself on campus in January, and so we did. We put together a panel, we put together a number of individuals from business to showcase what our students are doing and the role of UWM's research and impact in the community. Let me share with you a few highlights. And by the way, Senator Darling called me the day before and said it might be very beneficial to tape this because we can put this tape in front of a lot of other legislative leaders and talk about the great things that UWM is doing and the impact it's having in this state. So one of the representatives was Brian Cook. He's uh, Vice President for Products at Johnson Controls. His quote was that UWM is a place that we choose because there is a value created that is a shared value for the community, for the students, and for the company. Now, of course, in an hour and a half discussion with a lot of different individuals, Brian said a number of things, but this is one that I thought was particularly powerful. Another speaker was Jen Miller. She's at A.O. Smith, and she's the Director of Corporate Development and Strategy. Her comment was, Having UWM and this partnership with Freshwater Sciences is absolutely critical because we get those relationships with the new students who are graduating who can become employees later on. She separately made a comment about how she had moved here from Philadelphia and she wondered why A.O. Smith's headquarters were in Milwaukee. She understood the family connections, but she said she wasn't here very long at all when she realized with a campus like UW Milwaukee and the talent and research that's provided that is no question as to why A.O. Smith stays here in Milwaukee. <clears throat> Another speaker <clears throat> was Julia Taylor. She's the president of the Greater Milwaukee Committee, representing between her and the work that's represented by Tim Sheehy at the MMAC, virtually all major employers in southeastern Wisconsin. And her quote was that UWM is changing lives, and changing those lives <clears throat> is what keeps companies here. And I think that's a great short quote. <clears throat> Tim Sheehy was one of our speakers who said directly to the legislature, we're asking for your eyes and attention on a proportional investment in the UW system and in particular UWM because it's going to have a good double bottom line benefit for the community and the state. So this was an important meeting. This is something where afterward, later that night, Senator Darling sent me a text and she told me how powerful and successful the day was and she thought it was so great. And she continued to say, we've been trying to meet with the governor because we want to get this story. And what happened later was that she was able to arrange a meeting and we, Tom Lujak and I, visited with the governor's staff on Tuesday of this week. And we presented a four minute version of this hour and a half. We didn't have them uh, go through the entire hour and a half, but we really captured some of the highlights from these and several other speakers. We had our students profiled, we had uh, different, different uh, faculty and staff and individuals that, that we really brought home the sharp points. And we compared and we brought that forward with some of the other elements that line up with some of the work that's happening across the system. And I have made a strong advocacy for both the UW system and especially our role in this budget, recognizing that we're not going to get a separate piece other than in the capital budget. So these are the types of things that, that, that build and snowball, as well as Senator Darling sharing this video with a number of her colleagues, as well as others in, in the Capitol. So that's the budget. Moving into the second building block, looking at this in terms of strategic opportunities, originally in November, I had announced to the campus a quest for what I called at that time strategic visioning. But as we got into this work, the question emerged, we have a vision, we have a mission, we have different um, values and, and, and elements. Let's make sure we talk about this in terms of what it actually is. And what this recognizes is that much like this, document UW System Forward 2020 is a powerful and compelling platform that is being used to, to justify additional investments in the UW system. We too need to have a strong platform that's clear that says, not just in terms of preventing cuts, but in terms of really enhancing and building our budget and strengthening our position in brand and in fact, we need to have something that is a clearer, stronger, crisper way to compel individuals in the community, the legislature, in the regents and system to support UWM even further. I was challenged last fall by both President Milner and President Cross to develop this 
and we have undertaken it with vigor. I give a lot of credit to the 21 individuals who've been working over the past month to month and a half, a lot over the break, especially with a lot of two, three hour meetings to engage and learn a lot about where we are and to start drafting a statement that we want to engage the campus in next. So this is an effort to take charge, to define our future in a different way, where we will have a crisp, clear course for what we know are our priorities. Those priorities, of course, include our work around student success, research, and engagement, but there's buckets that I consider to be critically important to enable that. And that's what you see at the bottom of the slide, the funding and revenue opportunities. Those fall into three buckets. Number one, state and legislative support for the campus, for UW system and UW and portion of that budget. So that's some of the activity that we've been talking about and we will continue to have even further discussion with a lot of additional legislative meetings as well as media exposure and things that I'll talk about in a moment. The second bucket is the partnerships, those with the Rockwells, the Johnson Controls. And frankly, when we talk about healthcare, nonprofit, the arts, education, name the sector, and it's those partnerships that will increasingly be valuable for the types of funding and the creative ways in which we're going to have support. And we see that all of the time in different activities and partnerships that we are particularly blessed by to be in this community to have those types of relations. The third and final category or bucket in terms of funding and revenue opportunities is in the world of development. And I give our staff and so many of you credit, our development staff, in terms of our campaign, which is called Made in Milwaukee, Shaping the World, to really build such momentum. In fact, at the end of last year, in December, we were at $121 million, $121 million and less than a month later, we are at 124 million, which is 71% toward our $175 million goal. We'll be going public in September with this, and we're contemplating whether we stay with 175 or go to $200 million. So this is a wonderful place to be. But that enables us to have support for scholarships for our students. It supports our ability to have more endowed and named professors. It supports so much of the research activities above and beyond what our regular budgets do. So it's critical as we think about building a strong future that we recognize these different revenue sources and do everything we can to maximize those. So that's a powerful part of what we're doing. So how we're doing that is through what just rolls right off your tongue, CSAUG. Like that? CSAUG. Okay, so maybe not so sexy, but it's what it is. Chancellor's Strategic Opportunities Work Group. This group has 21 individuals who have multiple members from all of our key governance groups, has functional leadership from the vice chancellors on this campus, and a few other selected individuals. And I named one of them as Mike Falbo, our former regent president. Couldn't be more helpful and valuable with some of the external work that we're doing. We want to make sure that we've got good representation and we engage today the campus and other parts of our community. On Monday, we will share a draft summary of both the statements of strategic opportunity as well as the pathways to achieve them. Over the next several weeks, as that website is, is uh, available, we want your feedback and we will be having an open forum on February 7th in which we will have members of the group share the feedback that has been received so far, and the latest version of that statement. We'll continue to have discussion and seek your feedback. And by the end of February, we will be having this in a much more public manner shared with, with our regents and uh, system, UW system. I talked to Ray Cross in my one-on-one -on -one with him yesterday and gave him an update on the progress. And we're visiting with uh, Regent Milner in mid-February to give her a progress update at that point. So there's a lot of eyes and there's a lot of importance on us moving forward quickly in a focused manner that helps differentiate where we are. Um, as we then look ahead at what I consider to be our essential elements, there's five different areas that I'd like to focus on. So what we've done so far is talked about the budget in the context of what I consider to be managing. Kind of like the here and now. How do you, how do you deal with the situation that you're in? As you know, We've had a series of biennial budget cuts, but nothing as severe as what happened in the last biennial budget. We have to put that in context. You also know the world that we're in because of the demographic headwinds and a tuition freeze, what that has done. We're being very successful, and as painful as it is, 
as challenging as, as it has been, we have done remarkably well and are making, making great progress every day in terms of our research, education, engagement. But as we look ahead, and that's what the Strategic Opportunities Group is going to help us really build on, what are the critical priorities within each of those areas around research, student success, and engagement? What are the things that we know right now are what I consider to be essential elements? I'm going to share with you five. The first one is our Research One status. I want to start by talking about the centrality of research and what I hope to you is a powerful differentiation or a juxtapositioning of where we were and where we are today and what the R1 status has done for us and why it's so critical that we maintain this to the greatest extent that we can. I was new to administration on this campus in 1997. And one of the things that I had been doing was pursuing with Johnson Controls work in executive education, as well as continuing with the professorship that they had named, but they had dropped it. It was a professorship in warranty and reliability analysis. And while I was pitching this to Johnson Controls, the number one largest company in the state, publicly held, they told me that we really value what you do at UWM in terms of the talent pipeline. And they talked about where the employees come from, where they go, and they really, really uh, stressed that that's what they see UWM as doing. And they went on to say, however, in the research front, as a global company, we can work with universities around the world. And we choose to work with, and they talked about this school, they talked about that school, they talked about premier research universities, they talked about the investments that they made, and they said, we don't see universities. UWM at that level and in that place. So thank you for the talent. Let's keep focusing on that. Well, 20 years later, we have great programs with them still today in executive education. I'm proud of that. But what I'm even more proud of is the fact that over the last several years, Johnson Controls has invested over $7 million in UWM. Our joint partnership has brought $35 million to this state in terms of federal funding. We have an endowed professorship, a number of student interns, and an incredible talent pipeline. This is a powerful contrast from where we were 20 years ago and the value in what Brian Cook, that I just shared with you, what Brian Cook can say today. I have had additional meetings with senior leadership at Johnson Controls, and guess what? We're building even more powerful relations that bring together a lot of parts of our university, not just single siloed area. They really like the interdisciplinary nature of the work that we're presenting to them. So that is one reason why R1 has to maintain, to the greatest extent that we can, its centrality and focus. But I want to broaden the picture a little bit. R1 is foundational to what enables this campus to teach so well, to engage in the community, and to really be the place that we want to be and what we're so proud of. It is imperative, therefore, that we preserve our research investments and we continue to go down the path that we have been doing for the last couple of years, disproportionately at a higher level than other compensation, increasing our graduate students' comp. We have to do even more. We have to, to continue to keep that as a priority. The development activities that I shared with you earlier have to be even more focused. We have uh, recently been able to name a gentleman, Seth Siegel, as a, professor, a named professor um, for a, a period at the School of Freshwater Science. We've been able, through the Catalyst Grants, to give over $4 million from a development activity there. And I could give you example after example of different activities that development can increasingly and must increasingly be involved with. We also have to continue with our strategic position control to identify in every school and college those functions, operations, areas where we are most effectively, most, most in terms of from an ROI perspective, most, most uh, capable of getting the greatest returns. And then we have been very fortunate to have a research excellence team that since we started our strategic planning activities in 2012 has been providing a lot of detailed plans and steps to achieve the outcomes that we need. And we've been building on those in our strategic opportunities work group. One example of that among many others is the development of cluster hiring strategies as we look forward. So that's one essential element. A second one is student success. How foundational is this? It's critical. I commissioned a group last year to look above and beyond the different areas that we've typically looked at around retention, graduation, and other activities to look at what are we missing. And this group 
looked at a number of different areas and came up with a number of suggestions. Three of the themes that came together included advising enhancements and hiring a new director. So welcome Bill Hebert to uh, UWM and uh, we've, we've hired that new director, he starts right now. We, um, <laughs> we also um, have received additional funds from UW System for a three year period to the tune of $3.7 million that I've talked about this fall in some of the budget meetings. They suggested as compared to going to one building and one location for financial aid, for another for enrollment, for another for advising, to another for different things that students need around housing. And you can imagine how bewildering it is on a large campus like this to not have a centralized place to go. So they advised and we have developed draft work and it will be implemented later this spring, an online one-stop service center and that will be followed later this year with a physical location or co-location, if you will, that's really going to make things a lot easier. A lot of the transition issues will be uh, minimized through this. And then finally, we know that student success above and beyond retention, graduation, a big matter in this area is internships, employment, preparation for life after uh, college, whether it's in graduate school, the Peace Corps, or numerous other areas. So we've made some modest additional investments, and we really want to work on coordinating and enhancing the work of our placement centers across campus. The community, business community, and many others are most interested in this particular element. So another piece of this, of course, leads to enrollments, and we know the foundational aspects of enrollments because of their impact on the budget. This year, our enrollments declined 4.1%, which has about an $8 million operating budget impact. And that's not one time, that means going forward, we've got $8 million less on an annual operating basis. If enrollments continue to decline, then we'll have to continue cutting our expenses accordingly. You don't get that made up. There's, there's no additional monies that come when you don't have uh, the tuition revenue from, from our students. So it's imperative. It's absolutely critical that we all do everything that we can to execute successfully our strategic enrollment management plan. For the first time in the history of our campus, we have a coordinated, integrated strategic enrollment management plan. It was developed well, and I think as you read it, and if you've been hearing about it over the last year, you would say these are the activities we need to do. Illinois is a huge opportunity for us because of the challenges their higher ed system and their, frankly their larger state budget is having. We have been very effective over the last two years, including data that is current as of this week. Our applications are up over 30% from two years ago. Our, our admits are up over 30% from two years ago, and we expect those trends to continue for some time. I don't know if in the long term that's sustainable three, five years down the road. There are campuses across the country who are pursuing the same thing with Illinois. Um, so that's, that's you know, a question about sustainability. But for now, it's very important to continue to do everything we can. We put a lot of additional recruiting resources, and you'll see even more billboards. I'll show you a picture of one later in this uh, uh, presentation. We have, as I've discussed earlier, enhanced our advising services and brought in more technology tools for scheduling. You'd be amazed at how much technology is playing such, a, such an increased important role in the world of advising and scheduling for our students. We do need to continue to increase our international students. While out-of-state students give us uh, generally one and a half times, if they're from the surrounding states, they give us one and a half times the tuition. International students provide double the tuition and often include room and, room and uh, housing, room and board. The, the challenge that we have, and, and, and we have to keep this in perspective, is the world is, is um, it, there's a couple of major trends that are going. One is where a lot of countries are developing um, their own education systems and wanting to keep a lot of those students at home. And there's a lot of other campuses that are also pursuing international enrollments as well. We have to do this because we're a global university. We have to do this because it's the right thing from a diversity perspective and to, to really have educated global citizens that our students must become, it's important to have that, that uh, perspective as well. We have been expanding our flex and online enrollments, and I don't know a campus today that isn't doing that, so we need to continue to pursue that as rigorously as we can. And then we need to continue to invest in both high 
achieving as well as more graduate students for our campus. That's critical to, to so many different things. And I want to stress the importance of how everyone can have a positive impact. That came through so loud and clear from our student success work group. And one of the things that they stressed was the concept of student or customer centricity and those, those personal connections that can come through. But we all have that. We all have that capability and it's so important. And I'd like to share with you a video that especially underscores the value of the human connection. My life was changed by UWM in more ways than I could ever tell you. You know those bootstraps that everybody tells you to pull yourself up by? I finally got boots by coming to UWM. We create a home for so many students that otherwise wouldn't think that a large university would be meant for them. I absolutely do not think I would be where I am today if it wasn't for the faculty at UWM. I'm the first person in my family to graduate from high school and graduate from college, and I wanted to do well. And at the time when I met Nancy, I was not doing well. I voiced my concerns to her, and she really reassured me. She basically forced me to believe in myself. I remember talking with her way back when she was a first-year student, and she was struggling, not unlike a lot of 18-year-olds. I had no idea how impactful that conversation was. I wanted her to know I stayed because of that conversation. It made me realize how much we can touch a student. I graduated in December. I finished my student teaching about a month after that, and the Monday after I finished my student teaching, I jumped right into my second grade position. While we understand the importance of the science, we're also very mindful of the impact that our research will have on the lives of many, many people we know and throughout our, our society. UWM does an exceptional job of bringing very real research and making it accessible to students here in the Milwaukee area. When you are in a very, very large research group at a very, very large university, you may never even see your professor or your research advisor. UWM has the advantage of being able to interact with prominent, well-known researchers um, directly. We're very gratified that the research that we're doing not only addresses real health care needs, real unmet needs uh, for, for patient care, but also provide the foundation for educating the next generation of scientists who will carry on this work. The internship in China was 100% a life-changing experience. We knew that it was a first-time experience, that they'd never tried it before. We knew there were going to be some challenges, but the excitement and the opportunity was just too great to say no. UWM is the perfect partner for this kind of uh, internship, and I think that's the one thing about UWM students. When we receive them as, as graduates, we really appreciate their ability to, to absorb, to provide leadership, and integrate into a global, uh, global culture that they would find in a company like Rock Automation. My life has been changed by UWM because it's very rare to have an intern be able to take a trip overseas. I hope in December of next year I can go into the workforce and start to make a difference in the Milwaukee community. You walk around campus and you always look for some place to fit in. There's no place to fit in. And then here's this, here's this office that says Military and Veteran Resource Center on the outside. Being able to connect with one another, form friendships. They also form a lot of informal mentorships as well, guiding each other on how to succeed in classes and how to develop social support and ties to the community. 20 minutes go by and you start hearing people talk like you're back in the company area or something like that, so you feel right as rain. And then they got other services that are off there too, so it definitely helps with being a student here. Working with undocumented students has given our center uh, even more purpose. We want them to feel like they're uh, part of the UWM family. I welcome that challenge uh, with a lot of pride uh, in knowing that we're helping them uh, achieve the same goals that any of the 26,000 students that are at UWM have as well. I get an amazing opportunity every day to work with students who are here beyond what was ever expected of them. They're leaving here with that degree that's very powerful 
full and leave behind state and county benefits that they had been relying on for years and really to model for their children other ways that they as a family can grow and make Milwaukee a better place. Working with UWM is actually very easy, and I believe we have a very high level of confidence in working with each other as, as industry and, and academia. UWM is like a melting pot, you know. You got people from all over the world, you got people from every walk of life. All the faculty that I've ever met at UWM, they have cared, and they have went above and beyond. Teaching is a human act. I think that at UWM we recognize that. We perform it as people. Did you enjoy that? Like I said, there's a lot of pride this week and all time in UWM, and so many things jump out at me from that video. The perfect partner, um, quotes like from Nancy File, a chair professor, I had no idea, made me realize the impact we have. 100% um, life-changing, teaching is a human art, number of different powerful quotes, number of things that are important. It's in that context that I think about the next essential element, which is the climate and the culture that we create. And I'd like to talk about that as an enabler and something that I've talked about before with you, but I want to stress a, a framework that really brings four different pieces together. We want to continue the work that we've done around our climate and culture, specifically in terms of some of the things the Panther team has worked on for the last year and a half or more. They've helped put together a training program for supervisory and leadership development, and we know the importance of that in terms of the quality of the relationship with supervisors, as well as colleagues, how vital that is for attention and, and a positive quality climate. They've also helped us with some of the compensation decisions as we had the one-time sum in an anticipation of the additional compensation increases that we'll have. The second piece of this is enhancing our diversity and inclusion really on the employment side of things. So if we stand back and we recognize we've done a great job with compliance, but we want to really go beyond that and talk about ways in which we can have a plan that, that we have specific goals in maintaining and enhancing diversity in all of our ranks, that can be nothing but positive. A third piece of this is the Multicultural Student Support Centers. So we've had Professor Rob Smith, Student Senior Affairs Officer Jim Hill, Provost Britz, Vice Chancellor Joan Prince, they've been working for the past year to determine what's the best organization for the delivery of our services, including both the academic advising as well as the non-academic support services. We've been finalizing an organization chart. There will be staff meetings shortly, and we'll work through the rest of the details. So expect some updates on that in the near future. And finally, in the context of inclusion, free speech, and safety, we'll have a panel of individuals and primarily external individuals in March, and we'll be talking about when does free speech become impermissible speech? What are some of the essential elements to understand about First Amendment and some of the issues that campuses increasingly are and will be facing even more in the future? We'll follow this up with the Campus Forum in May and continue to examine our practices and policies and the point of all of these areas, this thing that I really want to stress, is that we're, we're trying to be a campus role model for civility, for inclusion, for respect and welcoming of all ideas. It's fundamental, it's essential as a campus that we continue to stress those values, those ideals and have goals around them. The last essential element that I'll share with you today is consistent with some of the themes that I've been talking about already today, we need to take charge of our message. And I don't think we've been too passive in this regard. We have a well-developed Research One communication plan, and we've got a number of other areas, but we need to continue stressing the value of all that we do. Moving from defense to offense, you talk, you've heard a little bit about the legislative meetings that we've had. I can assure you that those are continuing. We featured uh, Dale Kuyenga and Senator Chris Larson, so Representative Kuyenga and Chris Larson, um, our alumni. Uh, was were, Both of them were at a, a meeting that we had yesterday in the community that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. 
we will have scheduled shortly after the governor's budget is announced with both the leading uh, papers, both the Milwaukee Business Journal as well as the uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel meetings with their editorial board about the status of the budget and what it means for us. And we'll continue to make advocacy efforts in the community. Chancellor Blank and myself are both scheduled to visit both the Madison and the Milwaukee Rotary this spring and talk about the power of research universities, what we mean to the state as economic engines. We are celebrating this year, as you know, our 60th anniversary, and we're taking this tour and show on the road. We're focusing on critical cities, not just in Wisconsin, but in other places. In fact, we have a national tour where we'll be going across the country in part for donor support, but also the partnerships, such as next week we'll be in Seattle visiting Microsoft, as well as engaging with our alumni in, in a number of different uh, ways. So it's powerful to do this, and you'll see as we continue to focus on such the billboard, the picture at the bottom is what you see in a number of places in Illinois and on your drive from Chicago to uh, Milwaukee. And uh, Trudy, we want you to really focus on those and, and uh, uh, make sure that you let us know how the commercials are working that we have in, in uh, Chicagoland. Some additional areas that we're focusing on include the talent pipeline. One of the critical pieces, in fact, the first one listed in the UW system forward forward is developing the talent pipeline. We have been working for the better part of two years on M-Cubed, and yesterday we had our public launch, and in, at the same time as we were having that launch, an interview that we actually were, were uh, recorded for uh, some time back appeared, and it was kind of funny as we were on the panel, some of us uh, passed this around, that this uh, was on the front page of the Journal Sentinel this morning, triple teaming for success, and it shows the exponential power of MATC, UWM, and MPS working together. We have 140,000 students across those three institutions that really mean a lot for this region. It's such a powerful way for us to have an impact and it's critical for our future. The number of students that come from MPS that go to MATC and on to UWM. You may not know this, but more students, transfer students, come from MATC than anywhere else, and there's more MATC students who go to UWM from anywhere else. Maria Gajorgiska Josevaska, our dean of the graduate school, has done some study of the success of students from MATC specifically and has found resoundingly successful results. This is truly a talent pipeline that we need to continue to uh, ensure greater prosperity. Some other activities, some other things that we have been doing. Some of the press that you might have seen but want to make sure when you know we're hard at work on making this case for UWM. I mentioned the, the uh, kickoff for M-Cubed. Recently in the newspaper, again, top, top, uh, top of fold front page, an emergency app that was developed with, with uh, physicians at, at uh, Children's Hospital with our students in our app brewery. We're looking at ways that they can enhance and, and improve the lives of children in emergency situations. Our research, our one prowess, has continued to be uh, something that's a focal point of a lot of our communication, with Ann Basing as one example of, of uh, just one of many geniuses that we have on our campus. She was officially recognized by the MacArthur Foundation as truly uh, one of the, the uh, global MacArthur Fellow geniuses. There's a number of different ways in which our story is being told. John Terenas, is one of our foundation board members and a, a very strong supporter. He argues that the best bet for Milwaukee is to grow UWM. I was in an M7 event on Tuesday night and I can't tell you how much buzz there was and people publicly recognizing the value of what we're doing. I will tell you that Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish at that meeting in her public address singled out UWM as one of the most important economic drivers and important assets in this region and she didn't mention any of the other 22 academic institutions. So it was a really, really a good thing to get that kind of recognition. Another piece is a part of a series that started this week in the Business Journal. And this full page ad, you'll see these every month. We call this an advertorial, and I'll be featured in terms of stressing many aspects of our, our one prowess. This particular story is about how we've joined this massive study of child brain development, major study, one of the largest of its type, to study 10,000 adolescents um, over the course of 10 years. And I'll be profiling and highlighting cases. We've got the year pretty much all mapped out. 
So we'll continue to stress these types of national and international types of impacts. We were recently recognized where we had uh, two, of our, two of our colleagues, Dr. Julie Bonner and uh, Jim Hill, who went to Washington to uh, hear from First Lady um, uh, Obama the, the, uh, the results of us having been recognized as one of 60 campuses across the country to, to be uh, a healthy, campus challenge winner. So this is something that stresses getting more of our students on health care insurance because we have uh, really about half our students that have coverage today. So we're really trying to get those numbers up as well as many other elements of a healthy campus. The final piece of our, of our uh, case is that we have been engaged through our challenge that I gave in the last plenary to have have you and our students involved in the community in recognized ways. And the challenge that I gave in light of our 60th anniversary is to have 60,000 hours instead of our normal 40 or 41,000. I'm pleased to report today that we're at 31,000 hours already after four months, and we will be celebrating this and giving more opportunities at the February 3rd, first Friday. So I look forward to seeing you there to talk more about that. So I want to give an example, as I wrap up here, I want to give an example that I think helps put it all together as we make a case for building a stronger UWM in the future. This is a picture or a series of pictures of some of the work that we do with Rockwell. And I mentioned this earlier um, in terms of, of some of the things that, that they invited me to, to share and showcase. But I want to stress some points of this. When I was invited in December to join with the CEO of Rockwell, as well as Dean Brett Peters of the College of Engineering, they wanted us to hear the stories of eight of our student interns and one of our alumna. And they went on to talk about all the different things that, that, that these students have done, but they began with a story of how our students have gone to a greater degree onto success than any other university from which they recruit. In fact, they started out with a slide that had 14 universities and bar charts representing the size and magnitude of both employees and then people who've stayed in their jobs. We were all the way over. We represented the largest number from any university of the 14 different campuses they recruit from globally. They were tactful enough to not put the names of the other 13 universities on there, but I could kind of fill in the blanks, and it was kind of fun to see that. The next nearest university was only two-thirds of the way toward where we were. That's how it started, and they went on to show these, showcase these stories, and I didn't quite know what to expect over the two and a half hours. This shows up on my calendar. I knew it was going to be big because I'd been at Rockwell a couple of weeks before, and people were pretty excited about this. But throughout every presentation, starting with Javion, a freshman who graduated from Riverside High School, is today an engineering student. He and his brother are going to graduate from UWM in engineering, and they're going to have so many opportunities. You wouldn't believe what, what Rockwell is talking about is the CEO on one side of me, and on the other hand, another one of our alumna, alumni um, was whispering, we need 23 more just like that. The CEO leaning over saying, we need 60 more just like that. It was a love fest. It was just incredible to have this kind of experience beaming with pride. It was that example that I shared with Senator Darling a week later, and she said, we need to showcase that for my other legislative colleagues. It was a powerful experience, and I asked Blake Moret, the CEO of Rockwell, to come and address our regents when we host them here in June, and he's graciously agreed to do that. And he is going to tell stories about our students, and he's going to talk about UWM and the need to provide greater support for that. And I can't tell you the power of that. It's that third-party advocacy. It's the kind of things that you see and you impact every day. But I think the story is particularly powerful because it integrates our research, it integrates how we teach, and it integrates how we engage in the community in such a powerful way. You know, at the other extreme, from JV and the freshman, you have some of our doctoral students who are working with our senior scientists, people who have so many patents that it takes two wheelbarrows to carry them across the offices, 250 patents some of these folks have. And our students are contributing to computer software design, new programs, new applications that are used globally. And these are companies and these are organizations that say we need more of what UWM is giving us. It's going to make a bigger difference. So as I close, I want to stress the most important essential element 
above and beyond how we're managing our budget, above and beyond what we're doing to lead and create a stronger vision, in addition to enhancing our R1 enrollment, student success, community engagement, diversity and inclusion, and taking charge of our messaging, nothing on this campus, nothing in this community that's important happens without you. Without the contributions, without your commitment, without the dedication and the things that you have all done, we would be nothing. It's so important to hear, I think, about the discipline that we have, the focus and the goals, but I just can't appreciate enough what you bring and how that contributes to the value and the importance of this institution, the things that you do every day that we don't see necessarily, like Nancy File. I didn't realize, she says, the impact, but your impact is like that, that uh, pebble dropping in, in the, the pond that continues to have such incredible rippling effect throughout so many lives. I thank you for that. Thank you for your attention today, and I'm happy to take any questions that you've got. Thank you. Well, <laughs> we're all shy. It's the beginning of the year. Any questions, thoughts, comments? Yes. Total revenue would remain the same, or tuition is going to be cut, and total re total revenue will drop. Which do you think is going to happen? My hunch on that question would be that tuition will be cut and will be made whole. That of those three options, legislative discussions have suggested that there's not necessarily a lot of appetite for this. In fact, several legislators have asked me, what are we hearing on campus? Are students really rallying behind that? I don't know what you've heard. I, I have not heard a student say, this is a good, a good idea. And what I tend to stress with legislators and the governor's staff is I try to point out that there's usually four or five major factors that drive the cost of, 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 of education. The number one most important is how much time you spend in college. That's the number one. Tuition is actually modest. There's housing, there's a lot of other things. So I try to demonstrate that, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of appetite. But the bigger point is, if the governor does put it in his budget, it's just like when he put a $300 million cut in, the legislature wasn't real supportive of that, but they brought it down to $250 million, and the governor ultimately, you know, that's what was the, the final budget. But uh, today, my bet, if I had to put it, is that there will be some cut because it's so politically popular on the left and the right, but it will be, will be filled in in some way. Now, what I hope is that it's filled in in some manner <clears throat> that, is, that is proportionate and representative of the contributions that campuses make. I don't think it's going to be a straight formula, so, so the devil's in the details on that. But that's my hunch. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, Nick. Um, so just in the last uh, day or two, we've heard news. Um, in the last day or two, it's been in the news um, that there have been or will be forthcoming executive orders about immigration um, that could apply to international students um, who have currently valid visas and that their visas could be voided, um, no new visas could be issued. So international students who are enrolled at UWM um, if they leave the country, might not be allowed back in. Um, what, is, what is the university doing to keep students informed and to take any action that it can take to prevent this from happening? Yeah, thank you for the question. One of the reasons I didn't go through, um, what, just let me, let me back up a little bit and talk about, the, in, I think it was December that we had at the faculty senate meeting a faculty resolution that was passed about um, areas that, that would um, help in terms of some of the sanctuary campus and some of the other, other aspects that would help and, and would address some of these uh, same types of issues. And out of protocol, having talked with our university committee chair and um, secretary of the university, their suggestion was that I would cover that at the beginning of the faculty senate meeting. So I've got some comments and some specific areas and a, and a long letter that will go to John and Trudy for distribution uh, later tonight or tomorrow. Um, and 
one of the things that, that is critical, and your question nailed it, what are we doing to educate our students and faculty and staff? And I'll go through specifically, uh, we've had training in um, December and in January, and we have more uh, sessions scheduled. The, the December training for faculty and staff was a completely full session. We had, I don't know how many people, it wasn't completely full in January, but we'll have more training sessions. Our student association is scheduling some, some additional training, and we have lawyers coming in to talk about immigration policy, and the date's been set. I'll show you a flyer for that. Um, but we basically are very much, we're, we're almost in complete alignment with the faculty resolution in terms of all the stance and all the activities that we should be taking on, on campus to do that. As you can appreciate, and if you look at the material that's happening, what's, as you talked about what's happening in the last 48 hours, What's happening today, if you look at the New York Times, has a series of articles that show both sides of this. Cities who are being threatened with having their, their, their funding, federal funding, stripped because of being sanctuary cities. Campuses, an article about campuses being hesitant to go down and use the sanctuary term because of fear of federal funding cuts. You know, juxtaposing cities saying, we're gonna fight you, and campuses saying, we're not gonna go near this because of their threat. So, so, so everything is all over the map, and that's literally real time happening. Just before I came over today, I saw some other articles about this. So it's really moving fast, and I know today and yesterday were the days in which bills were gonna be introduced. So it's, it's, it's moving pretty quickly. Um, and we'll stay abreast of this. We want to do everything we can to provide the safety, security for our students, for faculty and staff, and people who are concerned about this. We've had students that have been going to the Roberto Hernandez Center and talking about my parents are in Chicago. This is the dreamer type of movement where students are born here, but their parents came into the country, don't have appropriate documentation, and they are very fearful of the students' parents being shipped or sent or deported. And it's very concerning, and this is why when I go and I visit with our multicultural student support centers, they are pleading, and they use the word, we are desperate for faculty to be able to help here, to acknowledge what the students are going through. And that's a critical thing, and that's that human touch again. And, and to take some time and to express to students, here's some resources that we have, whether it's the Roberto Hernandez Center or UndocU Ally, some of the specific training, some of the things that the Student Association is really getting the word out on today. So we wanna really keep the communication up on this. So I hope that helps, that's a start. I'll give a little bit more in the Faculty Senate meeting. And with that said, that is our next agenda item. Um, so I know you're all dying to get to that. Um, so with that, I don't see any other hands up, but thank you again for joining us today. Have a great semester. Look forward to a successful 2017.